Hello, I'm Joanne Heiler, founding director of the Broad Museum, and I am incredibly excited to welcome you to tonight's conversation. This summer marks the 50th anniversary of the birth of the transformational cultural musical phenomenon, hip hop. And tonight we're very fortunate to hear from an incredible group to discuss its global impact. Here on the stage shortly will be the executive director of the Keith Haring Foundation, Gil Vasquez, the sister and of the late artist Jean-Michel Basquiat, and co-curator of Jean-Michel Basquiat, King Pleasure, Lisanne Basquiat, producer, curator, and president of Channel Zero Productions, Lori Bula, and legendary artist and public enemy co-founder, Chuck D. <laughs> This conversation connects to the Broads exhibition, Keith Haring, Art is for Everybody, which is on view right across the street all summer until October 8th. You'll see in the exhibition and you'll hear in tonight's conversation, 80s New York City hip hop was absolutely core to Haring's work as an artist and particularly public enemy and Chuck D. Their hits such as Prophets of Rage, released in 1988, inspired Herring and sometimes the titles of his works. A note for everyone here, tonight's tickets get you into the Keith Herring exhibition and to the Broad's third, third floor collection galleries for one-time access through this Thursday, June 22nd. So if you haven't seen the show, I hope you'll, you'll make it over there in the next couple days. And for that entry with your ticket from tonight, you do not need reservations. You come up to the front door of the museum anytime and show the staff uh, your ticket from tonight and you will receive access to the show. Tonight's program kicks off the Broad's summer long celebration of hip hop. At the end of the summer, we're presenting a special concert, concert featuring Grandmaster Flash, Tierra Wack, and a Jay Dilla tribute on Saturday, August 25th, uh, 26th, Saturday, August 26th. Tickets are selling pretty quick for that, so you'll wanna reserve yours soon if you'd like to hear the program and the concert. Uh, before I turn over the stage and the podium, I have some thanks that I uh, must convey. First, to the Broad's leading partner, East West Bank, for their generous and ongoing support of our rich slate of public programs at the Broad. Thanks also to our co-presenters of this event, the exhibition Jean-Michel Basquiat, King Pleasure, which is on view just next door at the Grand, Universal Music Enterprise, which provided generous support for tonight's program. Thank you, especially Vic Resnick, for all your work to support the Broad celebration of hip hop's 50th anniversary. And the enlightening PBS, BBC docuseries, Fight the Power, How Hip Hop Changed the World, which was met with global acclaim when it was released. We're screening the docuseries in its entirety for free to all museum visitors to the Broad on our second floor at the museum on July 22nd and August 19th, beginning at 1 p.m. Let a team member at the Broad know that you attended the program tonight and we'll make sure you're able to get in if there's a, you know, if there's a, a, a line to get in. Um, I'm now pleased to welcome Lori Bula, writer and executive producer of the docuseries, who will introduce an excerpt that helps set the stage for tonight's conversation. Lori? <laughs> Thanks, Joanne. Hi, I'm Lori Bula. I'm the co-creator, executive producer, and writer of Fight the Power, How Hip Hop Changed the World. When Chuck and I originally started talking about making this show, we really wanted to show the importance of hip hop. As hip hop has become a global phenomenon and is about to celebrate its 50th anniversary in just a mere few months, we felt as though there was a story of hip hop got lost. The things that actually inspired some of the most popular and iconic songs of hip hop. Everything from Grandmaster Flash's The Message to Kendrick Lamar's It's Gonna Be I, and of course, a couple of public enemy songs as well, like Fight the Power and Night of the Living Bassheads. So what we did was we crafted a four-part docuseries that actually walks through the call and response of social justice, socioeconomics, 
and just about all of the things that sadly we are still facing in 2023. These are evergreen issues that need to be dealt with and I feel like, as does Chuck, these hip hop songs have really addressed and captured it. Hi, everyone. So uh, thank you for the round of applause. It uh, warms my heart, and I know it does chucks, even though you can't tell. Take my word for it. <laughs> uh, I'm just happy I got a microphone on me. I mean, we keep these things after a while, so. Yeah, and they're, and they're taped to us, so there is that. So I'm going to uh, loosely, uh, not loosely, I'm going to briefly introduce everyone, even though I think we, everybody knows who everybody is, but maybe not. Uh, Gil Vazquez is on the end. He did not get the memo to wear black. <laughs> I'm the only one. I think he got it. And Sorry about to do that. Something. He's the executive director of the Herring Foundation. Lee Son. <laughs> My good friend, who I just met. Lee Son Basquiat, and by the way, the T is silent. She Thank educated you. me, and That's apparently right. my art teachers were wrong, so if all you guys are saying the T, stop it. <laughs> she is the co-admin of the Basquiat estate. Her and her sister do a fantastic job. <laughs> and this man to my right, known as Chuck Dangerous, the hard rhymer, Mr. Chuck D. <laughs> Feels good to be in this place, and um, definitely uh, next to Gil and Lasan, uh, you know, um, who also come from an area of expression and time where uh, if those voices weren't there, heard in, in the mediums at that time or socially, it definitely was coming out in the art. And out in that art expression, which I, I you know, goes back to my early days or even you know, as an infant in the early 60s, I recognized that, that noise on, on canvas and on paper and in paint. And uh, I was very fortunate to be part of the noise that was, ap you know, apropos in music and rap music and arts and culture on that tip. And then to go full circle to be on this panel today talking about how we railed, how we really raised against the machine back then you know, and, and art expression was like, it's a, it's a good place to be right now uh, to be able to have this discussion, Laurie. And thank you. And, and thanks to the crew in the, um, remind me of Fenway Park, you know, the bleacher <laughs> <laughs> behind the, great, the green monster. Yeah, so, I'm, not, so. I'm not thinking about that or the live stream because I'm going to get nervous because I don't actually do this for a living. I'm usually doing, behind the scenes. You're doing, you're okay, doing good. Fantastic. You're doing good. You're killing it. Okay, you're great. Doing. Okay, great. Are you going to introduce yourself? Oh, yeah. Hi, I'm Lori Bula, and I'm a Pisces, and, um, <laughs> and uh, I've, I introduced myself earlier, but hello, everyone, again. Um, Chuck and I actually created Fight the Power, How Hip Hop Changed the World, and I talked a little bit about it at the podium. It really came out of a conversation to talk about the importance of hip hop, um, and, you know, we embrace all hip hop, so whether your version of hip hop is Drake or Megan Thee Stallion, that's cool, um, but let's face it, hip hop as a culture as a medium has become commodified, and it's very much like McDonald's in many ways, and that's okay, but you know, you can't eat McDonald's every day, so our show is kind of the anecdote to that. I, I, think, in, I think in the beginning, uh, I, I, 
I issued going into the 50th year of hip hop, uh, as if we're going to call it a 50 year, and, and everybody seems to say this is hip hop 50. I said, well, hip hop 49 was important to me. Mm -hmm. And how do we make hip hop 51 be important, you know? And how do we make importance great, if not greater than popularity in hip hop and commodified culture? And um, you always got to have the pulse of the human being, especially in the time where artificial intelligence is not getting dumber. And especially as humans happen to fall back, AI is going forward. That's why you hear a lot of, in the arts community, a lot of people are screaming about AI. And I think it's something that we keep our humanity, we keep our pulse, the ability to say my bad and, and, and to be able, and what I learned uh, from the great expressionists of our time in the 80s and the 70s is that you want to embrace your mistake but scream as loud as you can about it. And that's your pulse, that's your style. That's your, it's, so today in music, uh, people are like, oh man, what you listening to? Music is being like, People today listen with their eyes. And, and music today is sight, sound, story, and style. All those four elements make what people think music is today. So here we come full circle, where you could watch a Keith Aaron uh, uh, um, piece, and also a Basquiat piece, and they didn't need a, a note next to it, but you heard it loud as hell. Right. We come out of that where you might have not seen anything. We didn't need a video. Once you heard us, you, see, you saw something, even before the video, because you heard, you saw what you heard, and back then, you heard what you saw. Now here we are full circle. Mm -hmm. So here we are. So here we are. So I'm gonna actually jump in, because I'm supposed to be the moderator. I don't know how I got, how I, you know, I don't know how I talk these people into these things. I feel like I'm a fake <laughs> in the funk, but so, Miss Lisan, I know that we talked a lot about, you know, how you guys, how you and your sister started working with the estate in 2013. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. And what did you find as you were continuing to take the baton from, from your father, who obviously did an amazing job, but overall, especially from 2013 to now and the amazing exhibit, which you helped co-curate, right? The one across the street, mm -hmm. King Pleasure, which is fantastic. Everybody should go see it. Um, what did you think were some of the things that surprised you as you were continuing to take care of, you know, not only the estate, but be very much the ambassador to everything that was going on? Mm. Um, my father's name was Gerard Basquiat, and he claimed his son when his son passed away in 1988, and spent the rest of his life fighting for his son, fighting for his son's uh, respect, and uh, fighting to ensure that his legacy was valued and that the world knew that he was valued by his family. Um, Janine and I, and I, we were talking about this in the green room, Lori, Janine's my sister and she's the co-administrator of the estate with, uh, with myself and we co-curated the exhibition across the street. Um, I always had this fantasy that our dad was gonna kind of sit down and give us like the skinny, right? Right. <laughs> like it was gonna be like this boys in the hood moment and we were gonna like, he was gonna lay it all out. And that didn't quite happen, but what, what did happen is we stepped into a world that in many ways we had been protected from mm -hmm. because we were able to kind of live our own lives and do our own thing. Uh, but what surprised me was that while we didn't get that, you know, seat, that kind of sit down, we, learned a lot along the way. He talked a lot, we heard a lot. Um, and I think what surprised me, or what I marveled at, was how profound an impact Jean-Michel has had on the world and on pop culture and on music and art, all forms of art. And, um, and that wasn't because my father passed away, I think it was just like what has happened and the trajectory of Jean-Michel's life and, and career. Uh, and I think that that is, um, it's kind of surreal. You know, this dude who was like, you know, the first generation of a Haitian and Puerto Rican, uh, Haitian and Puerto Rican parents to say at a very young age, 16, that, you know, I'm gonna be a famous artist one day with dreadlocks in his hair. 
back in the 70s when no one was doing that. And a black dude was definitely not doing that. And for him to, as uh, soft-spoken as Jean-Michel was, he was so freaking loud. You know, he just, he, his, his, the expression of his creativity was loud and powerful and colorful. And, you know, and I've said this before, you know, he held a mirror up in the face of our culture and of the world and what was happening in our society and the ways that black people were being treated and the ways that people were being, or countries were being colonized and uh, racism, all of it. And so I think that didn't surprise me, but the, the extent to which Jean-Michel's voice has continued to be evergreen uh, is uh, just fascinating to me, surreal. And I think that that's obviously one of the things that Herring's work and Chuck's work, um, you know, not only does it obviously come out of New York from the 80s, but there's so many similarities. Mm -hmm. And as you look at the work, sadly, these issues we're still discussing today, and we talked a little bit about this in the green room, when we, re when we remixed Fight the Power in 2020, and I was actually doing a lot of the calls myself, so it was like I called Team Nas, and they were like, we'll get you reversed tomorrow, YG, have you reversed by the end of the week. Rhapsody, I'll do it in two hours. Yeah. And you know, we were asking people to just do it on the strength because we were trying to give a new soundtrack to the people who were actually doing the uprising in the streets. And we just really came from that place. And you know, at that point, we didn't know that we were gonna, you know, that the song was gonna open the BET Awards. We didn't know any of that. And of course, you know, Black Thought and Questlove also worked on it. Everybody did an amazing job. And it just, it was just this. It was a really bittersweet moment, actually. Um, obviously sweet that people, you know, moved so quickly, but bitter that we were still having these conversations. Yeah. Um, and with that being said, I'm gonna actually ask a similar question to Gil, because I know when you took over the foundation, what were the things that really surprised you, um, you know, the most as you were sort of looking at this global impact that, that Keith had? I mean, I think that you know, I, 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 it strikes me that, that young people, that Keith, Jean-Michel, still really resonate with young people uh, because they were courageous when it was not easy to be courageous. Keith was out. Keith was uh, out about being sick, about being HIV positive when it was not easy to be that. Uh, so I think that courage um, resonates. You know, if you were there, uh, if you were in the 80s and you lived through some of that, if you lived through HIV AIDS, if you lived through the crack era, if you lived through the Reagan era, you, there's something that you immediately get when you see Keith's work, when you see Jean-Michel. Uh, Lassan said something about, you know, Jean-Michel being soft-spoken, but the work is really loud. And I feel that Keith, was very similar in that way. He was not a big rah-rah guy, but the work is intense and loud uh, and speaks truth to power. Uh, you know, Chuck, Jean-Michel, and Keith are still speaking truth to power because it's necessary. know that about 2020 and it's so interesting because we uh, we decided in 2020 the summer of 2020 that that was the time to put on the exhibition mm. that we curated across the street because what was happening needed the voice of a Chuck D, a Jean-Michel Basquiat, a Keith Haring and the fact that <laughs> the messages are so evergreen but it's like we needed that, we needed to hear that, we needed to, to know that um, the folks who care so much about life and about quality of life and about um, uh, the ways that people are being treated, um, you, you know, you hear Fight the Power Today anywhere in the world and like you know exactly what that's about. You see a, a painting by Jean-Michel Basquiat or by Keith Haring and you know that they were speaking about life and for me, 
what I marvel at is the generosity of you artists in the ability to be of service, to take this creative talent that you have and to, be of, to use it to be of service versus making it about like, look at me, look how wonderful I am, you know, which is cool too, right? <laughs> I like some of that. But it's like to really take this, whatever that is that you, you, know, that you have and what Keith had and what Jean-Michel had and to use it to help what's happening in the world because we needed it and we still do. Rasan, if I could just say that, you know, what, what I really admire about uh, what you did with King Pleasure and putting it together is that in the spirit of Jean-Michel, mm -hmm. you broke the rules, again. This show does not take place in a museum, not in a gallery. It's done, it's not, it doesn't have a scholarly uh, sort of slant to it. It's family, it's anecdotal. Uh, you're telling stories uh, and you make people feel really welcome. Uh, so I think in, in the spirit of Jean-Michel and in, in his sort of breaking the rules, you did exactly the same thing by bringing uh, King Pleasure uh, to what it is now. So just yeah. shouts to you and, and hats Thank off you. to you for that. I think, uh, you know, catastrophe happens at its own moment. And uh, it waits, it doesn't wait for technology, it doesn't wait for anything, you know, uh, tragedy, catastrophe, um, heinous acts or whatever seem to happen at a moment that sometimes, you know, the industries that quote unquote handle art are delayed by a timeline or delayed by just a, a, a protocol, which doesn't, especially now, doesn't allow it to answer right away. But uh, Fight the Power 2020, orchestrated by yourself and Questlove and many other artists that, that came to the call, is really pretty much was, was like the seed that, that this documentary, uh, Fight the Power, was actually spawned from. Because the beauty in this documentary that, that I, I saw from the outside looking in was that we wanted to make artists that people have been hearing for years not be interviewed, but really speak from their, you know, from their point of view of what they saw, what they came up with, or what, they, what they came up through, and speak on their own behalf. And Fat Joe and, and, and Moni Love and, you know, of course, Ice, Iceberg, Ice-T, they sound like scholars to the highest degree, really curating the art from a point that had long been forsaken and tossed to the back is like, well, we can't sell this. And I always looked at rap music and hip hop as high art anyway. That's right. I never was in awe of it, like, oh my God, because I was born in 1960. I was born in 1960 and raised and cultured enough to know that, uh, especially as a black person, black art goes back centuries to study and know that our expression was inside of it so we always knew everything about ourselves and everybody else because the art said so. Mm -hmm. One of my advantages in the 70s and the 80s, I knew every, and I went to a white high school. I knew everything about white America. They didn't know a damn thing about me. <laughs> I always was, I was, I had a cocky advantage everywhere I went in the 70s and the 80s. <laughs> but, uh, but I saw the, what the music was doing, like it actually hinted in the 60s and the 50s, like, we got something to tell in the story that's being prevented. It's being truncated, it's being left out. And this music, if it doesn't tell the story right here, then a person that, that the Queen later on calls Sir Paul McCartney and Sir uh, John Lennon or whatever, or Sir Mick Jagger and Sir Keith Richards meet on a, on a train platform in the United Kingdom back in the day in the 50s and why? They, they discovering blues, yep. blues records on the platform to, to call themselves the Rolling Stones after Muddy Waters record. And when they come to the United States, it becomes the newest thing ever because they're like, well, where the hell did this come from? <laughs> oh, it came from Mississippi, it's a state of yours. 
that's still lynching and hanging black folk. Oh yeah, by the way, wow, I think I heard about Mississippi on TV, mm. you know, and, and, and so that was a hint. And then hip hop was that second layer of the hint that included all of the elements, DJing, MCing, graffiti, breakdancing. We talk about that in the, decu in the documentary. But it wasn't in awe of these elements because DJing comes out of what? Musicianship. MCing comes out of vocalization. Graffiti comes out of what? Art culture, back, back before before. And then what? Dance culture goes back before before. So these elements called hip hop 1972, 73, or like a reopening of the door to say, acknowledge us in the words and the history that you ain't gonna get through your regular channels. Get it from the horse's mouth straight out. So also seeing the documentary come full circle to see these artists speak on what they witnessed and what they came through and how it hit them to say and do what they do was to me, it was a, it was a moment. And we're very glad that we started off this 50th year with this documentary on PBS and also across the world with the BBC to let everybody know, if you're gonna say that you love something, know thoroughly what it is before you say you love it. And what we wanted to at least also address, address our communities that listen, this is something that has to be rewoven in the curriculum and treated as high art instead of just low adolescent art. Mm -hmm. So that's why I never came into hip hop like, oh my God. No, I was already 13 in 1973. I saw it come along. I said, okay, this is the next step of the soul I've already had. I get it. Okay, there ain't a band there. This record's here. And the records for the DJ, the DJ always had to know and respect the musicians. They always respected, damn, the art cover. Right. They always respected the 360 degree universe around this thing that was starting to become hip hop. Rap music is not a music, it's a rap, it's a vocal on top of the musics that have already been defined. For years and eons, they, they've gotten that wrong. It's like people confusing rap music and hip hop. I'm like, well, how long is the public gonna keep making this damn mistake? <laughs> rap music is a vocal on top of music. It's an overdub. It comes from overdubbing. That's what an MC and a DJ is. It's a voice on top of a record on top of a turntable. And of course, you might say, all right, the apparatus changed this and that or whatever, but it's still the same process that has people saying, oh, oh, okay, I get it. Because saying that rap would disappear is about as crazy as saying, I wonder when these singing records are gonna stop. <laughs> it's a vocal, it's a vocal between talking and singing, and in the middle is rap. That's why it's so powerful because it rides on the musics that we all known and loved that come from all over the world. It even comes from birds in the trees. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's right. So I, I'm gonna jump in because as Chuck was talking about the four elements, and if you guys don't know what that is, you should probably ask somebody. But, so graffiti <laughs> as, you know, both of these esteemed gentlemen, whether it was the chalk drawings or the Samo stuff, when you were first seeing that and were aware of it, could you have ever imagined that it would go from that to how incredibly influential? And either one of you can start first. You can start with John. Um, no, because he was my brother and he was doing a thing, That's right. you know? Right. And it Were you just like, stop that? And no, just, yeah, yeah. he was just like, say, you know, he was same old and same old shit. And then, you right. know, and I knew he was doing it and I knew that he had something to say because he was uh, ferocious about getting right. it out. But I didn't, you know, I didn't think then like, hmm, I wonder in 2023, you know, right, how right. wonderful. Right, right, I'd be sitting on a stage yeah. in front no. of a bunch of no, people in a museum. All. Not at all. <laughs> but I knew, that I did know that um, that incredible energy that Jean-Michel held always, um, and that he had no, uh, he just was unedited, I knew that that was there. I knew he had a lot to say. I, know that he, I knew that he was like a sponge, and that he was um, 
frant almost frantically just like pulling in as much information as he possibly could, turning it over and spitting it back out. I knew that. But you know, the trajectory, not at all. I didn't I wasn't thinking. When you about said that. the word ferocious, it really reminded me. And excuse me, I keep fidgeting because these chairs are not made for people with a booty, so They're I'm having not. some problems. That's like okay. but just, I just having some problems. High, I'm high just chairs. This Next time we have to have chairs. a meeting about what we're going to sit in. Excuse me, everybody. I'm just having a moment. But uh, when you said the word ferocious, it really made me think of, you know, in my career, I've been really fortunate to work with really amazing artists in addition to being partners with Chuck. Um, and I've worked with everyone from Nirvana and the Death Row guys to Chuck. And the thing that I have seen is the best artists make the art regardless of whether or not they're going to get paid. They have to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's something I see all the time. And, and you can always tell, too, for you know, people who've been in the business for a minute, you, know, you would do the meeting. And then, you know, as soon as whoever you're meeting with starts by saying, like, I want to be famous, you're like, ah, it's probably not going to work. Like, <laughs> if that's your motivation, as opposed to being ferocious, you know, doing hundreds cool. of chalk drawings just because you have to, doing Sammo because you have to. Chuck makes music all the time because he has to get it out of him, which mm -hmm. you know, I'll let him speak to. But I think that that's also the difference of these guys' legacies, who they all have that in common as well, is that they're so incredibly authentic. And they make art for the sake of making it, not for the applause. That's and yeah. I think that that's I, really. I think, yeah. I think one of the big um, differences, if, if, and they're very few, but one of the big differences between Jean-Michel and Keith is that Jean-Michel was, he belonged to the hip-hop culture. He was yeah. hip-hop. Where Keith was a guest of the hip-hop culture. And, you know, when Keith was making chalk drawings in the subway, it was not, you know, it, it was not immediately respected by the graffiti artists. They looked at it, at, you know, with curiosity. It was like, what? What is, you know, this guy's doing it in chalk? Like, what, what's, he's not signing his name. He's not even putting his name on it. Like, what, what's going on here? But what he did was he earned their respect. He earned the graffiti guys' respect, which is not an easy thing to do. The graffiti guys were having their own conversation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that most of us, if you were not of the culture, you were not privy to the conversation. You didn't really understand you know, the, the battles and the, the wars that went on between graffiti writers, and Keith tapped into it. Uh, he respected it. He respected the calligraphy and the artistry and, and frankly, the balls that it took to, to spray paint on trains. Uh, and he respected it. And, and what he was doing in the subway uh, took a lot of guts, and eventually, they got it. Eventually, not only did the graffiti guys give him respect, but he, you know, he, was, he became uh, acclaimed uh, because he was so prolific, because it was not just you know, every once in a while. You know, he was all city. Uh, he bombed the entire city with those chalk drawings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you, you touched on something, so I didn't have a little sort of disclaimer moment, not that I need to, because obviously I'm melon and challenged. But, I, I grew up in the South Bronx in the 70s, which is, you know, weird because I'm 29, but I, I, you know, I, I very much grew up in the culture, but I still feel like I'm a guest, and to me, I just try to be of service to it and always do the right thing, and I never, it's interesting because I just had this conversation that is like a, let's talk about like a just weird evergreen conversation where someone brought to my attention that someone we know who's also melon and challenged always uses the N-word, and I'm so like offended by that. And when I see that, I, I really think, and I'm saying this to everyone here who's melon and challenged, we are guests of hip hop. We should all be of service to it. It is not ours. And if I can say that when I was break dancing, or as we called it, up rocking then, <laughs> like, belie believe me, you, you cannot think that it's yours. We should be of service, we should be respectful to it, and we should, you know, try whenever possible to, to do the right thing, as corny as that sounds, and as though I'm sounding like it's Spike. Not, it's, and, not, you know. it's not corny at all. You know, there's, there's an expression that we have, uh, game recognizes game, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you're authentic and when you show respect, 
it's obvious uh, to everyone in the culture that you're showing the respect uh, and you'll be accepted and embraced. Uh, when it's inauthentic, it's, it's really easy to spot. Well, I, I don't know, I, I, I disagree with some of that. Um, and um, uh, what, what you were saying, Laurie, I, art is in everybody. The For process sure. of getting art out of you is a whole nother different thing. And there's different levels to that. And like, I think that educational systems have failed in the, in the going into the person, the human being, and seeing where art is, because it's that expression. I don't think art belongs and owned by anybody except for their personal art. But the fact that somebody could touch upon art and do something, hip hop is a, is a language, it is a universal, a, a universal connection of culture that should be respected uh, by, uh, it, it should be respected from the people that it comes out of. Because for a long particular period of time in this country, it's always this, oh, jazz is wonderful, and blues is the greatest thing in the world, and hip hop is so beautiful. I said, well, do you love black people? Well, what the fuck well. does that got to do with it, you know? <laughs> it's like, it's, it, it's a process that comes out of us. And, and we as human beings, the thing about culture, it unites us as human beings and knocks the differences to the side, yeah. all right? But you, you can't take the byproduct and disrespect the people that it comes out of because there's a reason that black and brown people express ourselves in the way that we express ourselves, especially on this side of the world over the last four or 500 years. There's reasons for that. It's like, okay, if we're gonna be silenced, mutated, chopped up or whatever, uh, and not included in the dialogue of, of the makings of these these situations that we call countries or whatever the hell, then we're gonna express ourselves anyway, whether you like it or not, and it's gonna come out in the wash. And for the longest period of time, it, it's been kept as a, 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 you know, like back in the 1800s, they would go to Africa and find all kinds of things and bring it back to London <laughs> and hang them up and put a value on it and be like, okay, it's, this is wonderful. Yeah, but how about where you got it? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. How about the people sure. you took it from? The other day I was looking at... Who'd like it back now? Well, I was looking at some, you know, <laughs> like on YouTube, you could look at these old clips and it really, really show you before time, before hip hop, how racist this motherfucker really was, you know? <laughs> And, I'm, and, and I just said was, because it still is, but was? You go through YouTube and say, okay, I'm looking at TV on YouTube, 1970s, and not see a black and brown person ever. Right. Oh yeah, this is a commercial. Yeah, that's the guy that's changing the tire in the back. This is a black. So, all right, I got a barometer of how it was in the 70s. And then they talk about a diamond. Oh, like, this is the world's greatest diamond. And as I'm looking at this diamond that they put a value to, I'm like, now, I wonder how many people died mining this motherfucker. And, and, and it gets to the point where, okay, the value of something also has to be able to be in step with the importance of the people it comes out of. And that's why, that was the challenge to this, to, to this film. Fight the Power talks about the 50th year hip hop, but what are the socio-political conditions that helped make it in the first damn place? Oh, no, I don't want to hear all that. That's too heavy. Oh, yeah, I'm from fucking L.A. That's the New York shit. You know, I, I, I heard this before. You know, I, I, I get it. I get it. I get it. And, 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 and we're in a time where, where headline news is also metastasized in the social media where, okay, I got the headline. I don't want to hear no more. So everything's, life is truncated. And now people don't even know how to be even social media literate. They don't even know how to handle it. So social media overtakes their whole state of human being where they can't even process the amount. Of, and now, you know, new generations are all processed on what? Processed information, usually bad drama news at, at every term. And it has been leaked into culture. There's a study that, that popped up, somebody sent me, and I'll be, um, I'll shorten this note, that somebody saw, uh, that sent me on YouTube again, right? Um, brought to you by Google. <laughs> <laughs> but it's documentation, right? We can't laugh at the documentation. And it was 
the great Gil Noble, and Gil Noble was, was a, uh, and I happened to be on Gil Noble's uh, show. He was a broadcaster, black broadcaster, and a television broadcaster in the New York area. And he used to have this show, this weekly show called Like It Is. And they gave him a corner of the week where he would actually talk about black topics, subjects, what was going on. It was the obligation by the FCC to be able to say we have to, you know, the FCC is the airwaves of the people and TV. Okay, Gil Noble, you represent your people with that voice. Out of many voices, you got the black voice. Sunday, and, like Sunday, a at Sunday, 10 yep, Sunday at ten o'clock. Uh, but, but Gil Noble held it down. He, he took advantage of, of that, and he got across. He was important to us as Ebony and Jet at that particular time. Anyway, I'm looking at this clip from 1974, and it has this guy who was an FBI informant, and he's up there saying how we're gonna, how we're gonna use black culture in the next 30 years to infiltrate because, oh yeah, this is what the people do. They follow anything the culture says, and we have, we're gonna actually infiltrate black culture in order to make this next level of change to, to throw them back almost into some slavery. It's gonna be like a 30 or 40 year program, but they couldn't see hip hop coming. All they knew is that black folks follow black music a little differently. They follow films and all these other things a little differently. But this was actually like 74. They didn't know hip hop was coming. And they didn't know hip hop would actually come and be like, okay, this is a message of all to all for help at the same time. Because everybody in New York at that particular time was damned. And out of that damned, out of the, those ashes, you have Heron, you have Basquiat, you have hip hop speaking loud. So when they actually throw this socio-political background to the back burner, what they're doing is they're shorting the, the, the future intelligentsia of where this country got to go. Mm -hmm. This country would have never allowed, if it was thorough in, the, in, in the where the people come from and how we are human and how we think, it would have never allowed a Donald Trump up in there. Never allowed. Right. Also, it would have came hard on everybody else, too. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, here we are. Listen, we clapping now. Here we are, and 2024 is the haunted house. <laughs> Nobody knows what the fuck they, the, 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 it's like, we don't know what the hell we're going into. And here we go again. And this is what? That's the 51st of your hip hop, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> with, with, with a New Yorker looking to get the bottom line again. The bottom line say so. So you know, hip hop, you know, we could talk about commodification of rap music at one particular time. You know, Donald Trump was like a hero because we wanted to get that money like that, right? Right. And all of a sudden, Cat was like, okay, I, you know, I got hip hop behind me, so, you know, I got this New York thing, so we could splash it on the world and fool the rest of the country. Yeah, wait for it. So, um, Mr. Chalky, you actually have to go to the airport, so I do I'm going to ask if you want to say anything quickly before you leave us, and then we I will continue. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so, did you know? when you were working on Fight the Power and when you were creating your uh, contribution. The, the, the song Fight the Power? The song Fight the Power. Did you know? Well, yeah, because the Isaac Brothers made Fight the Power in 1975. Mm -hmm. And it turned me out. It was the first record I ever heard of cursing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, listen to the record. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, you're hearing like, you know, you grooving. Back then, it's like right at the cusp of disco. They like soul R&B records. And the Ozzy Brothers is the Ozzy Brothers. All I got to say, if you don't know how important the Ozzy Brothers is, ask your grandparents on Twist and Shout. Ask, you know, your parent about Between the Sheets. <laughs> <laughs> ask, so some of these so people were made to that song. Ask your uncle about It's My Thing. That's right. Go <laughs> ask, hey, ask hey. people that, that, that was also R. Kelly fans are with Mr. Big, you know, like, <laughs> Ozzy Brothers, they need a documentary on them because they're the yeah. greatest group of all time. <laughs> I mean, okay. damn. I mean, okay. how, you can, how you can have a 55-year musical career and white folks don't know just puzzles me. Yeah. 
It just puzzled the fuck out. This is why we make documentaries. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, really. That's right. I mean, hey, we got what? Universal in the house. We got Warner we, we in the have, house we up have there. Jeff right here. And Jeff we have up James there. Hey. Neither, which sat in their yeah. seats, by the way, we, that we, were over there. But our friend Adrian sat in his seats. We got Sony over there. And, 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 and all this catalog and documentation of what can teach the world the next 25 years when it's looking for answers, it's in that music. That music was the mm -hmm. best teacher. So. Did you feel it? Did you I, know? I, I felt it, but you know what? I, I came with a team, and we understood how we were hit with music. Mm -hmm. So when Spike Lee said, I need an anthem, we knew we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We didn't sample and take the record. We said, listen, we want to be able to give the same feeling that we got at 15 years old. Understand, I'm 15 years old in 1975. What was happening? Look at the timeline. You just had a president that got, well, not impeached, but he was up, the, he was up out of there. And this whole country was like, what the fuck are we facing in 1976? In 1976, the Ozzy Brothers come out in 1975 with Fight the Power. Bicentennial is 1976, the next year. Hip hop's in its third year. You already have a lot of parties going on in the Bronx, which mm -hmm. is burning at the same time. The Yankees happen to win the pennant. <laughs> Don't say it like that. And, 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 and Don't say my Yankees like that. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm just saying, saying. I'm saying a lot of things was happening at the same time, and nobody knew what 1976 was going to look like. At the same time, we're talking about Rockefeller might have been, you know, the, the president, and the government was like, oh my God, we can't have that. And then, you know, a country guy by the name of Jimmy Carter came in and kind of like, what some time from the madness at that particular time. But hip hop was still talking to a lot of people at that particular time, like, if, if it's dark ahead, this is some light. Art was speaking to the people. Mm -hmm. I, I got my first job in 1977. And so as, as I'm traveling to Manhattan every day from Long Island, through a bus and two trains, I'm looking at graffiti. I'm very critical. Matter of fact, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, a, a big shout out to Dante Ross if you out there, because his book, his book, okay. and, one, and, and Dante one of, Dante's one of the greatest A&R record people. He got wax in his blood of our hip hop time. <laughs> you know, him, James, Lo, James Lopez. You know, those people grew up into the music, but, and, and, and Dante's book, uh, Son of the City, He's telling of a particular time where, yo, just every, just because things were done doesn't mean everything was good. I was going to work in 1977, and I was looking at some graffiti on trains. And I was like, that shit is whack. <laughs> I mean, I was I was 17 years old. I wasn't 12, and I was looking at people. And this is how critical I was in the arts, and it also carried over in the music. It's like, just because it's done, don't mean it's great. I would see incredible graffiti on the train. And the next day when I'm catching the train, somebody whack covered it up. That's how I was into the art. I was like, damn, how the hell did this person come along and disrespect this person's job? And so we already had categories in the 70s that people didn't even figure out until the 80s. Because you had fantastic artists out there that put their time in it, and you also had whack motherfuckers that came along, <laughs> whether it was music, whether it was art, whether it was dance or whatever. But then iron sharpens iron, and competition was great. So watching the consistency of Keith Haring and Basquiat in the 80s, that's what beat everybody else out. Mm -hmm. Their consistency, their love, their authenticity was like, yo, listen, they're going to do it no matter what. No matter how popular they are, they're going to be there, they're going to be present. Keith Haring beat out the graffiti artist just with his nonstop, he just was nonstop with it. And his style, he stuck to his style. He never, he never moved off his style. Right. But Asquiat would go up there with the higher ranks, and you know, we would get the news out along, because I, I, you know, I went to art school at the same time. So we know who's doing what in the schools and what's in the streets. And it was like, oh, this kid's up with Warhol in him, but he ain't giving up on his style, and he don't care if people don't, uh, don't understand it or not. That's, right. That's the thing about it. And before I leave, this is what I want to leave y'all with. In art, which is artificial, right? It's a facsimile of life. It's not really life itself, 
and everybody has art in them, the process is to get art out of each and everybody has to be through a thorough curriculum and an educational system. If not, you'll have a government speak to you about what it is and what it ain't. Now, you know, and, and that's it, you know. I, as we go into artificial intelligent, intelligence, it's very imperative that you hold on to yourself as much as possible. If you're in the arts, hold on to your mistake. Your mistake is your pulse. As we go into artificial intelligence ruling the roost, it will get perfect. Hold on to your pulse as much as possible in your decision making, who you like, what you don't like, because what you don't like is very key. You know, you don't want to be robotic. You know? Right. Robotic is like, you know, hold, hold on to your scars. You know what I'm saying? Hold on to your scars. I mean, I mean, I mean, I understand plastic surgeons get their thing, but come on now. <laughs> Every little fucking thing. Let All me right, you, you gotta go, Mr. Chuck. I know, quick, I gotta go. Uh, real quick, um, for those that don't know, you know, obviously Chuck is, is Chuck, right? But Chuck is also a, a really amazing visual artist as well. I learned, I learned for the best, but I do got to catch this fly. I hate to be one of those guys on the fly, because I'm usually not. I'm usually hanging around, shaking hands. But I do have to catch this flight. It's a very important sure. family Thank matter. Thank you, Mr. Chuck. Chuck talked about um, education, and um, I was a little intimidated to come and talk about hip hop with Chuck D. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, I know hip hop. You know, I'm of the hip hop generation, but I I'm gonna do a crash course. And so I watched a couple of the episodes of your series, and um, it's as much an education, because educate, you know, Chuck mentioned education. We get it in a lot of different ways. And the series and the documentary that you all pulled together is as much an education about the 80s, about the culture, about social justice, about politics, as anything else is. So if you have not seen it, watch it. Find it and watch it because it is an incredible. I will give you a dollar later. Thank you. <laughs> a dollar? You said 20. 20? I know, my bad. Yeah, no, but I watched 20. it and it's like, and I was like, oh wow, yes. Like it brought me right back to that time. It brought me back to just the complexity of what was happening in the world at that time. Yeah, I mean, look, that was, that was the point. And, and you know, um, you guys didn't see episode one, and I'm just gonna jump back there for a second because, you know, we talked a lot about, and again, I was in the middle of like the South Bronx at mm -hmm. the time. And yes, it was on fire. And yes, there were like abandoned buildings everywhere and heroin was the drug of choice then not crack. And there was all these really horrible things and we actually kind of dialed it back a little bit in the series, but what we were trying to show was, had it not have been for those conditions where, you know, the borough, the, well, the whole state of New York was bankrupt, but especially the Bronx. But had it not have been um, forgotten, had it not have been in some ways looking post-apocalyptic, hip hop probably wouldn't have been born there, maybe would have been born in some war-torn place, to be honest, because it really was about music and oppression and about people not, you know, th this is the great thing about people is the resiliency of people. People will not have people take their joy no matter how much you put their, somebody puts, you know, their foot on their neck. And I think that that was really the beauty of hip hop coming out of that. You know, it's really mm -hmm. like the rose out of the concrete. Right. And we wanted to show those things, but we also wanted to show the policy that did it, because a lot of people talk about, you know, um, you know <laughs> systematic racism and they don't even know what that means. But it's at every level, it's at local politics, it's at whether or not your trash gets picked up, it's at whether or not it's easy for you to vote. I mean, it happens everywhere, all around the world, which is why the show has really resonated. Mm -hmm. And those were the things we wanted to show. And then of course, hip hop's amazing response, the call in response to it. So that was, um, so I, I hope everyone watches it. It's really not what you think. 
and that was what we were trying to do, but to go back to what we're talking about today. So we talked obviously a lot about the 80s New York, and the 80s New York, that time can never happen again. Right. I mean, look, artists could afford to live then. You could live in a squat. These are all things that don't exist anymore. And I think that this is one of the many things that troubles me about this country is there's no underwriting and there's no support of the arts like in some other countries. Like I was just in Canada and everyone's talking about how you know the government paid for their, to make their album and pays mm -hmm. for their living or whatever and I can't even fathom. So, um, oh, so, so, so the thing about the 80s is, you know, had the 80s in New York not been what it was, Herring would have happened someplace else. Basquiat would have happened someplace else because they wouldn't have been able to afford to live and to be as ferocious in creating their art. And I think that that's something that people don't really think about. Yeah, yeah and, but I think, you know, I don't know about Keith, but I know Jean-Michel was couch surfing. Like he, right. you know, he was, I think today, um, and I don't have anything against social media, but I do think that there's this idea today that you know, things are really quick and easy. Right. Right? Like you just go out, you do something, it's brilliant, and everybody swarms in and they love it and you're wonderful. And there was there was a um, there was a road, there was a journey to what Jean Michel did. There was a journey to what Keith did. Right. You know, the the, the consistency, the persistence, the right. diligence, the the, the, honor, the discipline yeah, the and tenacity. the tenacity and the courage and the ability to honor yourself, the create, you know, what you have, what they each had inside of themselves and to ensure that whatever it was that they wanted to do and to express actually happened. And I think that in a lot of ways that is somewhat missing today, that in this world where things are so instantaneous, you know, it takes time, it takes diligence. And if you have something to say, and if you have something to create, it's so important to respect that in the way that you want other people to respect it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. And to get used to hearing a lot of no's. Yeah, absolutely. Did you, did you want to add anything to that, I just, Gil? I just want to add that, you know, it's interesting how, you know, the, the doc reminded me about how much the 80s are romanticized. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's like this longing, like, oh, you know, rent was so cheap, and you know, <laughs> the music was so much better than, than it is now, and the art that they were making was, was so great. But it was in response to really tough, really hard things that were going on uh, politically, socially. Uh, the Reagan years were hard. The Reagan years were very tough. Uh, you know, I, I, I kind of went back to see, to do a little, you know, just finding out what, what Reagan's response was to HIV. I think the first time that HIV was mentioned in the media was in 1981 in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. so it was described as gay cancer. Uh, Ronald Reagan took office in January of 1981, offhandedly mentioned HIV AIDS in 1985. And that was only because he was forced, actually. It, just an offhanded yeah. comment and yeah. didn't mention it in a speech till 1987. Yeah. I mean, that, that to me is just, you know, sums up, uh, you well, know, I, kind of the times and, and what was I going on. I think it's on. hard to really explain, though, that time where, you know, AIDS was rampant and even before it was called AIDS, because if you weren't alive then, and we've talked about this a little bit, and Ed from The Broad and I have talked about it a lot, is, you know, there was a time when I had, like, a, a big portion of my friends were just dying. I think anybody of a certain who was, age who was alive during then, that right, time, right. that was true for everybody, you know, living, uh, anybody of a certain age in that time, yes. Mm -hmm. it, it, was, it was very commonplace to us, whether it was, you know, friends, family members. Um, yeah, it was, really, it was really a horrible time. Um, but yes, rent was cheaper. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, I don't know. <laughs> there was that, I mean. There was that. Yeah, um, I think we're getting close to wrapping up the little ladies nodding at me. The nice lady, I shouldn't say little lady. My apologies. <laughs> I'm just saying all sorts of wrong things up there. That's okay. <laughs> don't do let it. me do this again, just ever. Do it. Just ever, yeah. Um, do either of you wanna have, uh, make a closing statement about anything 
I mean, look, really, but let me also say before you, I say that please go see the Herring exhibit and the Basquiat exhibit, and don't stop there. Go and support art, buy art, and really, even if you've never heard of the artist and it's on the street and it's $2, buy the art, support the art, because if you don't, nobody else will. So that's my, you can give me that $20 back. Um, I just want to add on by, by, you know, just sort of remarking about how interesting a coincidence it is that Jean-Michel and Keith are showing across the street from one another. Um, and there's a, a famous quote that I really, I really like, and it's, coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. <laughs> and that was uh, Albert Einstein. That's great. Please go see both shows, uh, not just see them, feel them. Spend time. Um, I think, I think the Broad is doing amazing work for the community and for artists. Um, and my hat's off to uh, Eli Broad for that. He was an entrepreneur who decided that this was important enough to, uh, that art was important enough to pay attention to. Uh, and what you all have done and what you continue to do for the community is amazing, so thank you for that. Uh, the, this herring exhibition is freaking amazing. Um, and I had the opportunity to meet Keith's sisters, and I know one of his sisters is here tonight also. Um, please also go see King Pleasure across the street, Caddy Corner, where Jean-Michel and Keith are hanging out on the same street <laughs> in 2023. And, um, and that exhibition is about family, it's about legacy, it's about honoring um, our family, and it's about respecting and honoring the creativity and the energy that a person has within them and also understanding the complexity of that and how challenging it can be. Um, I think that if there, these are two artists and Chuck D and the work that he's done to really help to ensure that hip hop is respected as well as culture and as an expression of, uh, an artistic expression. And so there are a lot of, I think these three incredible artists have helped to make people understand that it is possible to make a life out of what's in your heart and what you have to share, it is possible. And I think that that is probably the, the loudest thing that you know, Chuck D, Jean-Michel Basquiat, and Keith Haring have, uh, God bless you, have said, and that is that it is possible, but it takes diligence, it takes a lot of luck, it takes not accepting the no's, mm -hmm. it takes ensuring that you get the business acumen part of it and the art. Don't just lean on your art, figure the other side of it out too. So just thank you, and this has been an incredible conversation. So thank you guys, and I'm just gonna say for those of you who wanna stay, we're gonna actually play out some more of the series. We will take you to LA in the 80s, and boy, was that a good time. And um, we will touch on you know, all of the fabulous things that Daryl Gates did to the city, and we will go all the way through the LA uprising. And for those of you who think you know the story, just trust me, you're gonna learn something different about it. So I hope you guys hang out. It's gonna run about 15 or 20 minutes. And um, we're gonna leave the stage now, and then I'm gonna come say hi to some of my friends. But okay. thank you guys so much. Place? Yeah, you should go. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There you are. Okay, I'm done. Thank you.